Hello, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon now. Um, so, yes, I'm Jenny Gove. I'm a UX research lead at Google. I, I work in California. And um, my talk is about transforming the web for better conversions. And we're going today to explore the current state of the web and what ca uh, websites are capable with these new technologies. So why the web? Well, I'm a fan of the web because it's an open ecosystem where links can be made between any of the nodes out there, where people can traverse from one node to another just at the click of a button. It enables people to explore, it enables people to search, and it enables people to discover. Now, as you all know, the web was started in the early 90s, and the major stores for native apps came along a lot later. They were opened in 2008 and 2012. And when the web began, this technology, the smartphone that very well illustrated here is so pervasive in our society today, didn't exist. And back when the web began, the most sophisticated of mobile phones looked like this. And we saw one from even earlier. I had no idea they, the first one was 1973. That's amazing. Um, but this, of course, didn't access the internet yet. And we've come an awful long way, haven't we? And it was these computers that we used for accessing the web at our desks, which was really the only place that we accessed the web back then. So the web was built for desktop originally. And in contrast, when apps were built for mobile, they were a whole new thing. There were no ultimate technical barriers to displaying desktop websites on mobile. It's a platform that can traverse devices, of course, as long as there's a browser there to do so. Websites themselves don't need to be installed. In contrast, apps had to be written from scratch. So in terms of user experience on mobile, we were thinking of mobile first in those cases. They were written for mobile, and they, in many cases, they raised the user experience bar on mobile, especially for the most popular apps. And indeed, our recent studies with users have illustrated that this is still evident. The web is still catching up in terms of user experience. Here's what our users say about apps. So this is one quote from a study I did. An app is designed to be around you. It's got your order history right there, accessible. It's probably got some sort of personalization settings. In my experience, apps have less features than a website does. So they're very streamlined, and they're tailored towards the end result. The same user went on to say, there's less features on an app because the goal is for it to get you there as quickly as possible. Now, that's not to say that there aren't mobile web experiences that do, in fact, surpass many app experiences. And there are, of course, very poor app experiences in some cases. Um, but there's still much work to do on the mobile web. And of course, there's the long tail of the web with poorer dis experiences. And despite the fact that poorer mobile experiences aren't surfaced at the top of web um, results, search results, it's still, of course, possible to easily link out and find yourself in a really poor experience on the web. So this raising the bar has been really good for the web. And it has motivated the newer technologies for better experiences on the web. Now, over the years, Google has worked with the developer community and website owners to make improvements to web experiences. And we've also introduced some incentives to do so on a significant scale. One of the things we did, and many of you will remember this, was to add mobile-friendly labeling to sites to give users confidence that there would be a usable website at the end of that link, and to encourage companies to do the necessary work to earn that label. And then this was launched back in 2014. And the cr criteria for that was avoiding software that was not common on mobile devices, like avoiding Flash, using text that's readable without zooming, sizing the content to the screen so that users didn't have to scroll horizontally. Remember, we used to have to do an awful lot of that on mobile devices. And place, placing links far enough apart so that the, the correct one could be easily tapped. So everything that um, Luke and Craig talked about. And we were able to take this away again in 2016, when 85% of the pages in mobile search results met that criteria. And we've also taken mobile optimization into account in page rankings. A big change for search ranking results was pushed out in 2015. And the press termed that, if you remember, mobile geddon. And there was a lot of concern 
But in the end, it was implemented without much of a hitch. And it brings significant benefits to consumers and companies alike. If a company optimizes their website for mobile, the user is more likely to convert because the experience will be better. And because of this, Google will use this as a signal for search ranking. There are so many activities that the web is particularly suited to. For example, exploratory experiences. When you're looking for something, in this case, case looking for cupcakes, or perhaps you're searching for a job. The web as an exploratory platform was also well described by users in the study I, I ran. They said things like this, if you're kind of like, I know I'm looking for this, then it's probably easier to go to a mobile website and search. And this user went on to say, I have a sense that there are more products and content available on a mobile website versus an app. So very much the web can often be about discovery. People use apps particularly for very frequently occurring activities. Examples might be parking apps, or directions, or commuting apps, and entertainment apps, and media apps like news and weather and music. But if you're doing something like making a large one-off purchase, you're, likely, you're unlikely to download many apps to do that. If you're in an exploratory mode, you're more likely to use the web to explore the different opportunities you have available to you. So not only have we actively worked to improve online experiences over the years, for example, advising on font size, tap target size, creating auditing tools to assess mobile optimization, but teams of folks have been working on browser experiences from a wide variety of different companies um, to develop technologies to underpin modern web experiences. These technologies result in web experiences that we're now calling progressive web apps. So today, I'm going to tell you a bit more about this. I'm going to go slightly into technical details, and you might wonder, what has this got to do with a lot of what we're talking about today, UX design? But I think it's got everything to do with UX design, because the technologies that are coming enable us to design for new kinds of experiences on the web. And this needs to really be a developer-designer partnership. So Progressive Web Apps is just a new name for new features and technologies of the modern web. PWAs are enabled by a new set of capabilities that enable designers, in collaboration with developers, to radically improve the user experience we provide for our users on the web. And we do this by making sure our experience is fast. We've heard a lot about this in the last two days, making sure it's really speedy and performance is good. Making web experiences installable with experiences like adding the icon to the home screen, launching from the home screen. It can behave and it can feel to users like it's an app. And we need to ensure web experiences are reliable for people in places where there are flaky or even no Wi-Fi. And we also need to keep users engaged. So let's start with fast. So users don't expect janky scrolling or slow load performance from a really good app. And the web in the past has had a bad name for their slow performance, particularly on mobile. And by performance, I mean in-page performance as well as load performance. Web loading has to be as invisible as we can make it. Just like with good native apps, web apps should just be expected to work. This is the expectations of people. Now, it takes a mobile web page a median time of 9.3 seconds to get to what we now call time to consistently interactive on a 3G connection. It's, of course, possible to take a technical approach to reducing this latency. So let's take Pinterest as an example. So in working on their site, Pinterest was able to reduce loading times for first meaningful paint on their screen from 4.2 seconds to 1.8 seconds, and time to interactive from 23 seconds to 5.6 seconds. So really impressive performance improvements. And their measurements for what they call core engagement increased 60%. And even as compared to the native app, their core metrics increased 2 to 3%. And ad revenue on their website, that increased 44%. Now, there's many ways you can make your site faster through auditing what resources you're sending to the user, how you're sending them, and working out how you can send less. And Google has a lot of information on that for the developers in your companies. 
Um, and today, as you've probably realized, there's a lot more sophistication in how speed is measured than was the case just a couple of years ago. These terms have been defined in you know, the last couple of years. Here's an example of a report from Google's Lighthouse tool, which is a tool you can use. Um, it's freely available to you to take these measures. It shows user-centric metrics about performance, such as loading time for things like first content full paint and time to interactive. So you need to decide in your company you know, what matters to you. And studies have shown that building the experience really helps with speed perception. Luke talked you through this in his talk, but let me provide you with another illustrative example. So I have a colleague, Mustafa Kultudu, who shows those options well um, with a newspaper app called Tailpiece that he created to illustrate this. In this first example, loading time feels longer because the user is left waiting for the content. And it shows the app in this thinking state, really, rather than working state. This is a well-established principle of UX design, which many researchers and designers have pointed to in the past. And in this example, instead of using a preloading spinner, the screen is filled with skeleton placeholders. And though, although this is better than what was on the previous uh, screen, Using it on its own in place of a preloader still isn't that great. It still gives the feeling of an error and doesn't show any context of the type of content that's coming. But using a mixture of skeleton screens, contextual metadata, and pixelated images that partially load, you can occupy a lot of the user's time and make the whole experience feel faster. The idea is to give context to the user of what's coming and load things as quickly as we can. And we call this staggering the load content. And Mustafa has some more design tips regarding perceived performance in an article he wrote for Medium called Hacking User Perception. So be sure to check that out. It's a great article. Now, we understand that for some apps, some web apps, it's important that they have the same behavior as other installed apps. For example, they need to appear in all the same places as, as people's other apps do on the phone. They need to launch from the same place and act in the same way. For users, there's no reason why the experience can't be the same for an installed web app as an installed native app. They, they don't have to tell the difference, right? There's no need for them. We just want the experience to be good. In terms of integration, now when a user visits your site, you can prompt them to add the site to their home screen. So a great example of this is Trivago, a major travel site that launched their PWA for 55 domains globally. And as you can see, when you add, um, tap add to home screen here, it hits your screen immediately. It's fast and simple, and it's available for users to access easily. And when it's added to your home screen, it's now more integrated on Android. Um, it's displayed in your app launcher, just like other apps, and it's part of your overall Android settings. So you can see that the web has become an environment that's fit for the possibility of providing really great user experiences, tightly integrated with the platform and hardware capabilities that exist today, and that are improving all the time. But users need better reliability as well with their devices. With PWAs, we make sure the experience always works, because when it doesn't work, or when it loads too slowly, it breaks that experience. And, and we're really trying to build the user's trust. And so it breaks that trust if that doesn't happen. So creating a reliable experience is really crucial. So when the user taps on the home screen icon, they expect it to load instantly. They expect it to be reliable. So we have become used to being online you know, all the time. And as much as I love this little dinosaur, I actually bought a necklace of him the other day because I'm off to Chrome Dev Summit, so I wanted to wear that. Um, as much as I love him, apps should never really show him, right? We often call him the dinosaur. So imagine getting a system-generated error message from an offline native app. That would seem crazy. Um, and it's not just no connection that breaks the user experience. Slow and intermittent connections, this Li-Fi that we're talking about, and you know what that experience is like. You think you're online, you've come to you know, a clear area when you're in London on, on the tube or something, and it just doesn't work. That can be even worse and more frustrating. So even where I live in the Bay Area, believe it or not, there's areas with poor cell phone coverage. And around London, too, um, you'll find a lot of areas with poor cell phone coverage, as I was finding last week. Um, or no connectivity at all. And, and Dublin has its own little experiences with that as well. 
And there are many people still in the Western world that have to use dial-up even to get online. And worldwide, more than 60% of cell phones are on 2G. There are many regions that will still be on 2G into the 2020s. And likewise, broadband infrastructure is often poor. As you can see, many people in the United States don't have access to fast broadband. And we see a similar picture in many other regions. Now, the news on this is that there now exists a technology called Service Workers. It's written in JavaScript, and it's a client-side proxy and acts as an intermediary between your web app and the outside world. It can cache resources to enable that reliable experience, no matter what their network connection is like, because resources can be pulled directly into the cache instead of from the network. And it also means your app can work even when there's no network connection. So for my profession, user experience professionals, it means that we will be designing for these flaky or offline experiences for the web. And a whole new area for us to explore is what can we achieve for our users, for our companies, when people are offline or in places with a flaky network connection. So these service workers are at the core and at the heart of, of PWAs. And they also enable push notifications that I'll come on to talk about. Now, Travago, as mentioned before, shows how investment in a reliable experience pays off. And Travago used service workers to build a really resilient app. Service workers and the cache API meant that their network resilience is becoming the norm for high quality websites like this. Um, and you know, if you can embrace that, then you can do wonders for your business. Their PWA is providing business value, and they've had a very large increase in um, click-throughs with hotel offers. And lastly, a truly enga uh, engaging app needs to be go beyond being functional and being reliable, and ensure the whole experience is really delightful for users and makes it very easy to do what the user wants to do. An engaging experience starts at the very beginning with a delightful first run experience. This isn't janky or slow. It's a good, reliable, interesting, um, delightful experience and continues all through your user journeys so that they work perfectly without friction. An engaging PWA uses the magic of the web, and that is that it's indexable, it's searchable, it's linkable, and it's shareable. The experience is timely. It's relevant and precise because it accounts for users' context. We need to think about that and what matters to them now in the moment. Making an app engaging ranges from basic experiences that are imperative to get right as well. And this includes asking permissions only when you need it, not as soon as the user opens the app. Surprisingly enough, we still see that, so um, check you're not doing things like that. And asking people to sign up and sign in at the right time when they're appropriately invested and there's something in it for them, not just their business. Another user experience to design for that it's possible now to do with the web is with push notifications. Um, and this example from Twitter, which is a, a web app I use often, um, has uh, push notifications with their progressive web app. Now, um, we should be conscious and mindful, of course, about how we design such schedules. And I know there's been a lot of work that's gone on to this um, on the native app side, because there has been some disastrous in instances when we haven't been mindful. Um, and it leads to users turning their notifications off. But it does provide businesses now for a way to enable people to re-engage with the web which hasn't existed in this form before. And removing friction in forms. Many presentations, and Luke himself has talked about this on this stage many times, has talked a lot about forms. Unfortunately, we are still finding there are many, plenty of poor experiences on the web. I'm not going to go into detail here, but just to illustrate this. We did a recent audit in Europe on, on over 400 top websites, and we found that 42% of top sites from across 15 different countries didn't show the appropriate keyboard for the input type. And that causes significant friction. And it's a best practice that's been out there for a long time, so always worth checking. And we found that 27% of those same sites did not clearly identify optional fields. And remember, this is a top performing site. So um, this isn't you know, random selection. 
Um, and this, this particular one caused a couple of issues. First, users might be just simply overwhelmed with the sheer number of fields they have to fill in. And second, they may be hung up trying to fill in a field that isn't even applicable to them. And ultimately, this causes them to, to drop off. So a lot of the um, errors that we see with forms can be overcome by proper implementation and use of autofill. And, and there's um, a number of tips and tricks for developers for um, getting autofill right and making sure it works properly on your site. On the topic of integration, let's talk a little about, bit about new capabilities for integration for e-commerce. So digital commerce is a really huge deal. Last year, e-commerce was worth $2.3 trillion globally. Um, mobile commerce accounted for almost 59% of this. But it's still a fundamental challenge on the mobile web. The web has gone mobile, but conversions on mobile are still a third lower than on desktop. And it makes sense because it's hard for people to enter data on their phone. So we need better integration. We need better payment experiences. And e-commerce is definitely about all, removing all those points of friction. Um, browsers have worked to address this with autofill. And today on Chrome, 9 billion forms and passwords are autofilled each month. It's great, but it's not enough. So um, in thinking about how we get payment experiences right, they have to be quick easy, frictionless. We want to make it easy for customers to give us money, right? And for them to be delighted in the experience too and not frustrated. So Payment Request API is a W3C standard for browsers to provide an interface to users to enter payment and shipping data. And the idea of this is that users have consistent experiences and developers don't have to reinvent the wheel from a tiny boutique site to a large e-commerce store. And we're going further than this. Since conversions are much lower on mobile, we need to fix that. So we released a whole payment solution that companies can use in the form of Google Pay, enabling fast, simple checkout, providing an one place for rewards and offers. Um, and also, with the Google Pay app now, we've integrated passes and tickets. So the whole idea is that you know, users can have this one place to go to see all their transactions and tickets and uh, for sporting events and for travel and so forth. And so there's work on that for web apps site, your webs, your, your app sites, and then also with their own Google Pay app. So making sure the user experience basics are good, as well as enabling delightful, perhaps personalized, context-dependent experiences makes a web app experience really engaging for users. And at Google, we're working on creating progressive web app experiences that scale. So Google Search uses a PWA to make it possible for users to ask questions when they're offline and then get that answer back once they've reconnected. So these are some of the kind of things we're exploring. It uses service workers, background sync, and push notifications. It sends out a push notification when the answer is available to them. And by using service workers, the team were able to reduce the number of external JavaScript requests by nearly 50%, so improving performance as well. And they were able to reduce the number of user interactions delayed by loading JavaScript by 6%. So, so some great performance metrics on top of that and making a better user experience. Being able to meet the user not exactly where they are, but getting that answer back for them as quickly as you can. Bulletin is a new way to create and share hyperlocal stories, and it's all built around a progressive web app. It's a tiny fraction of the size of what a native app would be with 100% of the functionality. They do some really neat stuff with media capture APIs, and that's a whole other topic that I'm not going to talk about today for progressive web, web apps, but everything that can be done now on the web with media, with VR, with AR, um, all these things are now a, we're able to do on the web. Um, and they make it easy for users to catch, capture the moment for this hyperlocal app, and sharing is as simple as sharing a URL. So it would be great if these improved experiences are available to users no matter what browser they use. If the browser supports it, and if designers therefore can design for it and developers can build for it, then all these possibilities exist. And this is a reality. Service workers are now supported in essentially every modern web browser. And, and there's more if this slide changes if we present internationally, because there's more internationally that support this. Um, so this now includes Safari and Edge. 
And browser, vendor, um, browser vendors are adding support for all sorts of new kinds of capabilities to enhance the user experience. So as I talked about before, there's lots of new media APIs coming as well. So that's the basics of progressive web apps, and it's exciting to see how these are transforming the user experience. Um, let's take a look at a very successful PWA that was launched by the team at Starbucks. It takes advantage of many new capabilities, and it makes it easy to browse the menu, customize and place an order, and pay for an order. So let's take a look at this in practice. So here I'm looking at my order. I'm going to have a chai latte. I'm going to add that to my order. And I think I'll order an Earl Grey back tea as well, add that to my order. And I can see it's there in my bag. I get to review it before I check out and pay with my Starbucks card. And I think at the end, I get to see how long it's going to take for my, um, my order to arrive until it's ready. So that was a pretty slick experience on, on the progressive web app. Um, so your site not only has to load fast, it needs to feel like it, it loads fast. And that certainly felt like it did. Starbucks does this by using great placeholders and until the content is loaded. On fast networks or where the content has already been cached, your user won't even see those placeholders. Another aspect of the fast experience is navigating between pages. Navigations, again, feel fast and are fast. It never feels like a page does that whole like reload like we, we can tend to experience on the web. Um, navigation shouldn't rely only on the network, but instead everything should be pre-cached, ready to go. Now we've got this technology, why not? For some developers, as we've said before, they want their app to feel and behave like all other apps installed on the user's device. And by adding the install button, users could add it to their device, making it easy to access. And when it's installed, it launches from the same place as other apps launch on mobile. And it runs full screen without an address bar. And it's a top level app that you can get to using the task switcher. And when the user adds your progressive web app to their home screen on Android, Chrome automatically generates their APK. We sometimes call this the web APK. Having a web APK means your app shows up in the app launcher. So you can see that we're getting that experience for users. It's, it's feeling like the same thing. And it shows up also in your settings and where you can see the amount of storage used, its permissions, and so forth. So to make that experience really reliable, the Starbucks PWA uses Workbox with a combination of pre-caching strategies and runtime caching strategies. As the user uses the app, additional content is cached as they navigate around the app, and they can get to that in their offline experiences. Now, while placing an order is, of course, um, offline, is, of course, impossible, the Starbucks PWA makes it possible for the user to pay for an order in store, even when offline. They use IndexedDB to save information for each menu item, store information, the user's Starbucks card, and more. So it's a bit like that search experience that we saw. We're sort of edging towards the experience that they really want. We can't do this offline um, placing an order, but we can do it to pay for an order in the store. So Starbucks really focused on the user experience to make their progressive web app engaging. Placing an order has to be easy so that users can customize their drink with the many pos possible options that are available to them. And they paid attention to the fundamental details, like the navigation stack, making sure that the back button always does the right thing. For example, when you navigate down several pages, the back button goes step by step back up, rather than jumping back to the home screen or some other page that the user didn't expect. And to make the experience feel more alive, the Starbucks PWA uses content-specific animations. So they've thought about this. And they use particular messaging to provide feedback to the user. For example, after clicking Add to Order, it shows a little toast there letting me know it's been added to my bag. Now, as you can see through creating a fast, installable, reliable, and engaging progressive web app, Starbucks really put their customers first in developing an experience that meets the users where they are in the context where people are living, where they're working, where they're playing, to simply create as much as they can a convenient and delightful experience for users to order their favorite drink. 
And the experience has paid off for Starbucks as well. One of the ways they measure success is by the number of daily and monthly active users, and that's nearly doubled from their previous experience. Users are placing more and more orders through the web app, and the number of orders is growing over 12% week over week. And because Starbucks took this responsive approach and made sure the experience works nicely on desktop, they're also seeing desktop users using the web app to order ahead so their drink is ready when they get there on the way to work or on the way home from work. Now, we attribute a lot of the evolution of progressive web apps to mobile. We've talked a lot about mobile today. I'm going to move on to something different. Mobile has really been the key focus of progressive web apps. But while the growth of mobile has been really strong, as we all know, desktop use, we, must forget, we mustn't forget, is still growing. The graph shows that mobile phone use peaks in the morning and the evening, and tablet also has significantly higher use in the evening. Desktop usage, as you would expect, is more evenly distributed throughout the day than mobile usage. It has significant use during the day where people are at work and at their desks. Desktop use is led by mo mostly productivity apps. Many of the key apps that we use every day happen to be web apps. Things like Google Docs, messaging apps like Slack and Chat, music streaming apps as well, like Google Music or Spotify. And users have really high expectations for desktop apps. And progressive web apps on the desktop, therefore, need to be all these things again, fast and installable and reliable and engaging. That means, again, just like with mobile, they're launched from the same place as other apps are. They run in an app window, and they look and they feel like apps, other apps do on the desktop. So work on progressive web apps for the desktop is happening for Chrome OS, Mac, and Windows. And Windows users can already install progressive web apps through the Microsoft App Store. So this is where we start talking about the merging of these things, right? Now, if a team has created a progressive web app for mobile, then all that work still applies for desktop apps. Service workers make sure it works fast and reliably, and web push and notifications can be used to keep the user updated. And it can be installed with the add to home screen prompts, the same criteria required to show it. The only real difference is that instead of running in a browser tab, it's running in an app window. And with an app window, there are no tabs or address bar. It's just your app. It's optimized to support the needs of the apps with more flexible window organization and manipulation compared to browser tabs. App windows make it easy to unitask with the window in full screen or multitask with multiple windows open. App windows also make it really easy to switch between apps using an app switcher or a keyboard shortcut, such as Alt-Tab. So I want to point out a couple of the key components of the app window on Chrome OS. And as I mentioned, the app takes up the full window, as you'd expect, and has the standard title bar icons to maximize and minimize and close the window. And on Chrome OS, the title bar is also themed, so you can color theme it. Um, it's ba based on the uh, color theme, the themed color, in the web app manifest. So you can do that as well to, to make it more aligned. Now, within the app window, there's also the app menu, those three little dots you see there. And that gives you access to information about the app, making it easy to access the URL from there, print the page, change the page, zoom, or open an app in your browser, should you want to. And apps on the desktop have access to, as I said, significantly larger real screen real estate. So let's think about using that. It can be used to create additional breakpoints for wider screens. Some applications really benefit from that wider view. And when thinking about your breakpoints, think about how users will use your app and how they may resize it. So in a weather app, a large window might show me the full seven-day forecast there. And as the window gets smaller, instead of shrinking everything down, I might get a five-day forecast. And as it continues to get smaller, I might shuffle things around there. I still see the same content. It's just been optimized for that smaller display. And for some apps, a mini mode might be really helpful like this. This weather app shows me only the current conditions. Perhaps if we had a music player, it could just show me the current songs and the button to change to the next song. So you can take this idea of responsive design to the next level to support convertibles like the Pixel Book or the Surface. And when switched to tablet mode, these devices 
make the active window full screen, as you can see here. And depending on how the user holds the device, that may be either landscape or portrait view. So part of this is really getting responsive design right again, and that's what matters here. Whether the user has resized the window or the device has done so because it's switched into a tablet mode, responsive design is really critical to successful desktop progressive web apps. And that app window, it opens up so many new possibilities for us. So in taking a responsive pr approach that adds new breakpoints for larger screens, supports landscape or portrait views, works when full screen or not, um, and works really nicely with virtual keyboards, we can, again, you know, think about, be creative and think about the best way to support their user in their workflow. And what's next? Well, this is also um, available for Windows and Linux, and Mac is coming in Chrome 72. And for all of these platforms, we're doing the following things. We're also adding um, support for keyboard shortcuts, with badging launch icons, so users can be informed about important events that we don't need to send full notifications for. And we're adding link capturing to open the install PD PWA when the user clicks on a link handled by the app. So all these new enhancements are coming. And we're going to be continually updating this for Chrome and uh, making announcements about desktop PWAs. If you take a look at our Chromium blog, you can see those there. So we're really looking forward what, to what designers and developers together can achieve with this technology. So to summarize, I wanted to take this time that I've had with you today to tell you about progressive web apps, primarily because at this point in time, it's mostly been developer communities that are talking about this today because they're developing the new technologies. But I think it's important that we get our user experience professionals and design professionals on board with this to work together, as, as well as PM and Eng, um, to determine what experiences we can provide through this new technology of being able to cache for the web like this. Um, think about what we need to do in flaky connections or offline situations. There's all sorts of journeys, user journeys, that can benefit from this, such as, you know, what would we want to do for our company and what we provide when people are browsing content when on underground transit? So it's exciting to consider how these transformations of the platform of the web will support the next set of use cases and user experiences that we can design for. So I want to thank you so much for your time and um, look forward to hearing what your comments are on this. Thank you.